Lecture 58, Denise Diderot. With Samuel Johnson, Diderot stands as the embodiment of the Enlightenment spirit, the collector, classifier, and preserver of knowledge as a way to transform the world. Diderot was responsible for soliciting articles from leading thinkers of his day on various subjects, scientific, religious, political, economic, and aesthetic, for his Encyclopedia, or Analytical Dictionary of the Sciences, Arts, and Crafts, which he published between 1751 and 1772, and which diffused his and the ideas of his colleagues throughout Europe. In this lecture, we will examine the encyclopedia, focusing on the way in which its design and production attested to the editor's faith in reason and scientific progress, and to a radical and anti-reactionary political agenda, especially the promotion of tolerance and equality before the law. We will also turn to one of Diderot's dialogues, one of the many texts not published during his lifetime, but only circulated in private. Denis Diderot was born in provincial Langres in the Burgundy region east of Paris, the son of a master cutler in 1713. Many of his writings throughout his life attest to the admiration and devotion he had for his father, underscoring his respect for emerging bourgeois values in the 18th century. In particular, we note the celebration of artisanal industry in his encyclopedia where many pages are devoted to the role of manufacturing and tools. His philosophe brothers like Rousseau and Voltaire would garner public distinction very early in their careers, but Diderot remained relatively obscure outside of his intellectual bohemian circle until his thirties. Early on he made his living and reputation mostly as a translator. And it might be argued that his skill as a translator prepared him for his work as the editor of the encyclopedia. The art of translation requires, after all, the ability to put, new inf to put information into new order, to re-catalogue knowledge itself from one system of thought to another, from one langu language to another. He published his first original work, Philosophical Thir Thoughts, in the same year, 1746, that he was commissioned to translate Chambers' Cyclopedia, which was the beginning of the Encyclopedia project. Though he helmed the Encyclopedia project for 20 years, Diderot found time to write and publish prolifically on a range of subjects so broad that his own collected writing, writings can only be described as encyclopedic. Epistemology, the creative impulse, the dramatic arts, Evolution and materialistic determinism were topics he returned to again and again. He was a master of the written dialogue after uh, the Socratic technique that he used to communicate and develop his own philosophies, notably in two texts, Rameau's Nephew and D'Alembert's Dream. Like other philosophes, he was constantly threatened with imprisonment or exile for his subversive writings. Uh, his first three publications, for example, earned him three months confinement, and though there were over 200 collaborators working on the encyclopedia, Diderot was the chief writer and therefore bore the brunt of the church and throne's contempt and punishment. The bias against revealed religion and in favor of materialist, rationalist thought, as well as the radical political statements that were made by the very celebration of those whose labor usually went unrecognized, that is, the artisans, were a constant thorn in the side of the authorities. Diderot was greatly respected by his intellectual peers for a sparkling mind, but was plagued himself with doubts for most of his life about his talents, fearing that he lacked the innovation and craft of a creative genius because he was, after all, merely a cataloger. In his own lifetime, he was never held in so high a public esteem as Rousseau and Voltaire, but the 20th century rediscovered him and has resituated him as one of the greatest thinkers of the 18th century and an important contributor to 19th and 20th century thought. Diderot was first commissioned as the chief translator of the English Cyclopedia in 1746. 
The original director of this project resigned in 1747, and Diderot and d'Alembert, who were originally responsible only for the arts and scientific articles respectively, were promoted to co-editors of what was now the Encyclopedia Project. The project expanded in scope over the years. First conceived only as a translation of Chambers' two volumes, it then became a translation with original editions, presented in four volumes of text and one volume of figures. And then Diderot's prospectus announced that the project would be mostly original work, complete with ten volumes of text and two of figures. This was in 1750. Volumes were published one at a time, nearly annual, and annually, and additional volumes were conceived along the way. Over 200 collaborators contributed to the encyclopedia, including Voltaire and Rousseau. Many of them were polygraphs like Diderot, who wrote on a range of topics. But a new practice of commissioning specialists to write technical art articles was employed, which later became the standard practice for future encyclopedias. Diderot wrote the last ten volumes of text in haste between 1760 and 1763. The editors decided to print them all in one go in 1765 and release them simultaneously in 1766 to avoid further public controversy. However, the encyclopedia's publisher took the precaution of editing out some subversive content before going to print without Diderot's knowledge. Seven more volumes of figures remained to be published, but Diderot was essentially free of the project after writing the last volumes of the text. The last two volumes of figures were published in 1772, and the encyclopedia in its proper sense was finally complete, and comprised of 17 volumes of text and 11 volumes of figures in total. The range of figures included in the encyclopedia is enormous from illustrations of footwear through the ages, to classical architecture, to representations of various expressions of passion on the human face, to a variety of different hands engaged in different ta tasks, as well as numerous plates that showed rural and urban crafts and workshops, as well as illustrated accounts of cotton production with black slaves and Chinese workers. Unlike Candide in South America, no one who read the encyclopedia could claim to be ignorant of how the silk clothes they wore were produced or how the sugar they put in their coffee was harvested. The Jesuits, the Jansenists, the Archdiocese of Paris, Parliament and even the Pope all condemned the encyclopedia and its collaborators at one point or another during its many years of production. It was placed on the church's index of forbidden books. Chief among their complaints was its tendency to subvert royal authority, to corrupt morality and inspire skepticism. In other words, the same complaints that have been leveled against almost every writer we have discussed in this series of lectures. First among the Church's complaint was the insistence by Diderot that knowledge derives not from innate ideas, which are linked to some divine cause, as Descartes and proponents of Cartesian philosophy maintained, thus keeping the causal link between knowledge and theology alive, but, Diderot insisted, knowledge comes from the senses. Understanding derives from three faculties, the memory, the imagination, and primarily reason, which works by combining sense data and the other two faculties together with the sense data produce all human knowledge. That knowledge is arranged into a genealogical tree, which represents a mental order, if you like, the structure of the mind in its arrangement of the totality of human knowledge. It is also, however, the textual order of the encyclopedia. Thus, the epistemology of the editors is reproduced in the textual structure of the encyclopedia, reflecting the connections and interrelations between the articles in the text. 
under this genealogical order, the knowledge of God is located on the tree under the category of the science of God, which is a very ambivalent title, which itself is located under the category of general metaphysics, which in turn is a category of philosophy, which in turn is located under the heading of reason. Religion is likewise placed far away from the central trunk of reason on the branch located structurally alongside superstition. As such, the editors had rearranged the entire universe of knowledge, rejecting any absolute knowledge or institution that claimed to possess such knowledge and substituting in its place a secular and reasonable system. One can see why the church was upset. The encyclopedia was commercially successful despite all these many attempts by reactionaries to thwart its publication. And it attests, like Samuel Johnson's dictionary, to the success of Enlightenment projects at this point. Encyclopedic projects had proliferated since the 17th century, but none came close to the ambitious enterprise of the French encyclopedia in terms of its scope of content and breadth of collaboration. It was not just audacious in its controversial content and subversive. It was also immodest in its intellectual ambition. It was boundless. It was arrogant. It was more than just a book or a compendium. It is now recognized as one of the great intellectual events in history, and perhaps the defining intellectual event of the 18th century. The aim of the encyclopedists' enterprise was manifold. First, to create a compendium of all available knowledge. Two, for reference and the distribution of ideas. Three, for practical and historical purposes. Four, to reform the public and their prejudices. And five, to make a more virtuous society by educating them. And six, to reveal the organizing principles of human knowledge. An extraordinary um, pr project. Their approach to combining, compiling and presenting knowledge was innovative for three main reasons. First, they embraced empirical methods wherever possible. That is, they sought first-hand experience and analysis rather than simply compiling received knowledge. This meant they actually, actually had to go, as it were, out into the field and speak to the artisans who were working uh, to get that knowledge directly. Second, they made use of cross-references between articles to demonstrate the interrelationships of knowledge, as well as to obscure subversive content through distraction. Thus, a discussion of orthodox Christian dogma would be cross-referenced with articles on atheism or materialism. This required, it, this required the reader not only to think about the relationship between those two things, Christian, Christianity and atheism and materialism, but to sort of rearrange the whole body of knowledge that accompanied those concepts. And third, they believed in the instructiveness of everyday objects and professions, and thus placed as much value on those entries as on philosophical and abstract content. Moreover, they were advancing a radical political agenda. The encyclopedia argued that the ordinary citizen could know what only the elite were supposed to know. It suggested that anyone should have access to rational truth. It was then rather like the translation and dissemination of the Bible into the Vulgate, a revolutionary enterprise. Moreover, in its inclusion of the details of technologies for arts and crafts, it radically redefined what was understood to be the provenance of the intellectual. It, that was no longer just abstract and theoretical speculations, such as those that the inhabitants of Swift's island of Laputa undertook, but the task of the intellectual was now also to understand the practical and manual machines of modern society. Here is an excerpt from Diderot's encyclopedia explaining their rationale for the description of technologies and the wide range of arts and crafts that they included. Here is the method we have followed for each art and craft. We treated the following questions. The materials and the places where they are found, the manner in which they are prepared, their good and bad qualities, the different kinds available, the required processing before and during their utilization. 
Two, the main products that are made with them and how this is done. Three, we have supplied the names, descriptions and diagrams of tools and machines with their parts when taken apart and assembled. The section of certain moulds and other instruments if it is appropriate to know about the interior design, their contours, etc. We have explained and represented the workmanship and the principal operations in one or several plates where sometimes only the hands of the craftsman can be seen and sometimes the entire craftsman in action working at the most important task in his art or trade. With five, we have collected and defined in the most accurate way possible the terms that are peculiar to a given art or trade. It's this kind of detail about what previously would have been completely ignored by the intellectual class that makes the encyclopedia such a revolutionary project. Their theory of knowledge, or epistemological philosophy, was modelled after the experimental approach of Locke, Bacon and Newton, rather than after the ontotheology, that is, the study of knowledge as a branch of theology, of Leibniz, which organised and reduced all knowledge into a pre-established system of systems. In his article on philosophy in the encyclopedia, Diderot described it as the science of possibilities as possibilities. Even though he understood philosophy then as an open-ended system, it was still essential to see that system as existing within an ideal of totality. All knowledge had to be linked and any gap in knowledge was the result of a failure of thinking. The encyclopedists therefore believed that knowledge and its acquisition was in a constant process of evolution and could not be confined to any closed system. The process of writing the encyclopedia was itself an experiment in testing this philosophy of knowledge. Diderot was the chief architect, writer and often scapegoat of the encyclopedia, but it is difficult to distinguish his individual creativity within such a collaborative work. Ironically, those individual works and the ones for which he is best known today remained unpublished during his lifetime. From The Nun, an erotic first-person narrative of an illegitimate girl, Suzanne, who is corrupted in the very place she should find sanctuary, that is, the convent, to a long series of critical essays on the Paris Art Salon which mark the birth of the specifically French genre of art criticism to dramatic criticism and a discussion of the art of acting, to a text that cannot be classified according to any recognisable genre, and one wonders what category Diderot himself would have placed it in, because it is neither a novel, nor a play, nor an essay, nor Socratic dialogue, nor, despite its subtitle, a satire. This is the text, Rameau's nephew. All of this Diderot is producing, even while he is writing articles for the encyclopedia. I want to talk now briefly about Rameau's nephew. As I said, there's no easy way of stating what this text is in terms of its genre, and there's no easy way of stating what the subject of this dramatic dialogue is. I call it a dramatic dialogue. That's, that's my category. Because the two characters, him, Rameau's nephew, and me, Diderot perhaps, wander conversationally through various social, musical, literary, morally, moral, political and philosophical subjects with interruptions for outrageous performances from Rameau. Rameau's nephew, I should say. Finally, Rameau's nephew remembers he has to be at the opera and he leaves with no resolution to the many threads of conversation that have been started. The range of possible interpretations of this witty, scatologically, gossipy, philosophically uh, inclined discourse is as great as the number of subjects that the two characters discuss. But it is possible to identify two distinct, distinct strains of argument that run through this dialogue. The first is the debate over the moral purpose of art, and the second the debate over two fundamentally 18th century beliefs. On the one hand, the emotional belief in perfectibility, moral progress and the essential goodness of man. And on the other, the position of the absolute materialist, which eventually results in amoral determinism and utter cynicism. The dramatic dialogue opens when moi, me, speaks. No matter, he says, what the weather, rain or shine, it's my habit every evening at about five o'clock to take a walk around the Palais Royal. Remember, the Palais Royal is the theatre that Moliere performed in. 
I'm the one you see dreaming on the bench in our garson's alley, always alone. I talk to myself about politics, love, taste, or philosophy. I let my spirit roam at will, allowing it to follow the first idea, wise or foolish, which presents itself. Just as we see our dissolute young men on Foy's walk, following in the footsteps of a prostitute with a smiling face and inviting air and a turned up nose, then leaving her for another, going after all of them and sticking to none. For me, my thoughts are my prostitutes. If the weather is too cold or too rainy, I take refuge in the Regency Cafe. I like to watch the games of chess. Uh, one catches immediately um, that sense of the solitary walker uh, that we've heard about in Rousseau's uh, reveries. But here, the walker is not engaged in a reverie in the natural world, but in the center of the city. This is a world only to be found in the city, a world of dissolute young men and prostitutes, of fashionable cafes and those who frequent them. Can the speaker claim a moral superiority to Rameau's nephew, who is utterly cynical, when he, moi, aligns himself with this world? Is his intellectual life the equivalent of the utterly vapid and sycophantish life of Rameau's nephew, the him who will soon be introduced? What does separate the two exactly? How would one judge their relative value to society? When Rameau's nephew arrives and they, we, they begin their conversation, we see that the chess game is not only being played around them, but that their conversation is a kind of chess game. And this reminds us that their relative moral values are necessary to enable them both to be players. Each needs the other in order to articulate a system of morality that has coherence. Each relies on the existence of a world that seems different, but which is essentially making the same moves. My reading of this dialogue, then, is one in which the distribution of cynicism and amorality is equal. For despite the ample evidence that Rameau's nephew provides of his complete lack of moral or ethical standards, his interlocutor, moi, finds him amusing, at least as much as he finds him repulsive. Here is the scene where Rameau's nephew speaks of his genius in pimping for his aristocratic friends. He's describing what he does uh, when he goes to visit the young woman who is the subject um, of an aristocrat's desire. He says, you play with a sheet of paper between your fingers. What's that? It's nothing. It seems to me to be, it's a letter. For whom? For you, if you are at all curious. Curious, I'm really curious, let's see it. She reads. A meeting, that's impossible. Perhaps when you are going to Mass. Mama always comes with me. But if he came here early in the morning, I get up first, I'm at the counter before they get up. He comes, he is pleasing. One fine day at dusk, the girl disappears, and I get paid my 2,000 écus. How come you possess such talent and are short of bread? You wretched man, aren't you ashamed, he says to himself. I listened to him. This is moi speaking. I listened to him. While he was acting out the scene of the procurer and the young girl being seduced, I was pulled in two opposite directions. I didn't know whether to give in to my desire to laugh or get carried away with anger. I was perplexed. Twenty times a fit of laughter prevented my anger from bursting out. Twenty times the anger arising at the bottom of my heart ended in a burst of laughter. I was taken aback by so much cleverness and base behaviour, by such valid ideas alternating with false ones, by such a general perversity of feeling and such a complete depravity and such rare frankness. He noticed the conflict going on inside me. What's the matter with you, he said. The conflict generated by Moi's recognition that even the most despicable immorality is amusing might perhaps lead him to the conclusion that to speak of his thoughts as his whores is the first step in erasing the distinction between those dissolute young men and himself. If his belief that his superior mor morality is aligned to the superior of his superiority of his thoughts, which in turn he implies is the result of reading the right books, then to make himself a pimp for knowledge radically undermines the moral instruction that literature should supply. 
In fact, Rameau's nephew is much more direct in his response to the claim that literature should both educate and entertain. He says, him, I've read, I read, I constantly reread Theophrastus, Labre, Moliere. Moi, those are excellent books. Him, they are much better than people think, but who knows how to read them? Moi, everyone according to how intelligent he is. Him, hardly anyone. Could you tell me what people are looking for in those books? Moi, amusement and instruction. Him, what instruction? That's the point. Moi, a knowledge of one's duties, a love of virtue and a hatred of vice. Him, well, I gather from them everything that one should do and everything which one shouldn't say. So when I read The Miser, I say to myself, this is Moliere's miser, be a miser if you want to, but be careful not to talk like a miser. When I read Tartuffe, I tell myself, be a hypocrite if you like, but don't talk like a hypocrite. Keep the vices which are useful, but don't assume a tone or an appearance which will make you ridiculous. In order to be sure about this tone and appearance, you have to know them. Now, these authors have provided excellent portraits of them. I am myself, and I remain what I am. But I act and speak in a way that's suitable. I'm not one of those people who disparage the moralists. One can profit a lot from them, and above all, from those who have put morals into action. Vice doesn't hurt people, except now and then. But the visible features of vice injure them from morning to night. Perhaps it would be better to be a scoundrel than to look like one. Insolence in a character is only insulting from time to time, but an insolent appearance is always insulting. As for the rest, don't go and imagine that I'm the only reader of this sort. I've no particular merit in this, except that I've done systematically, with a keen intelligence and a reasonable and true aim in mind, what most others do by instinct. This is the central question. How does one prevent the instruction of literature from being used to instruct the scoundrel as well as the potentially virtuous man. Moliere claimed that he had distinguished between false and true piety in Tartuffe, but what if he had thereby made it easier for the scoundrel to imitate true piety, which is exactly what Rameau's nephew is saying? How does the artist control the consequences of his work in terms of its moral effect? And does he have any duty at all to attempt that control? These are not questions that are merely historically interesting. They are questions that are pertinent today. Finally, the question of free will versus fatalism, or perfectibility and human goodness and cynicism. Rameau's nephew tells the story of a dog to illustrate the brilliance of one of his society cynics. What about that little dog? What are you talking about, says moi. Him? Where have you come from? But in all serious, you don't know how that extraordinary man set about detaching himself from a little dog and attaching it to the keeper of the seals who had taken a fancy to it? Moi, I confess I have no idea. Him, so much the better. It's one of the most beautiful things that could be imagined. All Europe marveled at it, and there isn't a single courtier who wasn't envious of it. You're a man who doesn't lack a certain shrewdness. Let's see what you have done in his place. Remember that Bourret was loved by his dog. Remember that the odd costume of the minister used to terrify the little animal. And remember that there were only eight days to overcome the difficulties. One has to understand all the conditions attached to the problem in order to appreciate properly the merit of the solution. Moi, well, I have to confess to you that in this sort of thing, the simplest things baffle me. He's also called Mr. Philosopher all the way through. Listen to me, says, says him. Listen and admire he, Bourret, has someone make him a mask which looks like the keeper of the seals and he borrows the latter's voluminous robe from a footman. He covers his face with the mask and puts on the robe. He calls his dog and caresses it. He gives it a biscuit. Then all of a sudden, with a change of clothes, he is no longer the keeper of the seals but Bourret. He calls his dog and beats it. In less than two or three days of doing this exercise from morning to night, the dog learns to run away from Bourre, the farmer general, and run to Bourre, in the mask, the keeper of seals. But I'm being too kind. You're a layman who doesn't deserve to be instructed in the miracles which go on right beside you. Are we the readers like the little dog, running from one master to another? Is this kind of instruction the equivalent of the instruction one is supposed to receive from the morally enlightened work of literature or philosophy? If not, what distinguishes it from such works? Aren't we, who pride ourselves on our discernment and capacity for moral improvement, fascinated and amused and instructed by the story, both the story of the dog and the story of the cynic and his philosopher friend, whose thoughts are his whores?